Hi, I'm Christopher Ray, and welcome to the first of three video lectures about Moyen's novel, Frog. I recommend that you also take a look at the brief video introduction I made to Moyen's life and works. Frog, to me, is one of Moyen's relatively overlooked and underappreciated novels, and one that is, I think, sometimes misunderstood as being simply topical about the one-child policy. This is a novel with a lot of complexities. We have a multi-part structure with letters and a play, and a novel, and a lot of storytelling within the storytelling. And Moyen, in this creative retelling of history from a very personal perspective, has also, I think, chosen a very ingenious motif, the frog. Frog could be considered a work of historical fiction in that it is inspired by true events, specifically a nationwide policy to control China's population, commonly known as the one-child policy. The one-child policy is something of a stand-in for what is actually a series of policies that the Chinese Communist government has implemented and imposed on the populace over the course of modern history. So in this first lecture, I want to talk a little bit about what Moyen is responding to or what he is inspired by. So how does he fictionalize history would be one way to put the question. You could say that history has actually overtaken fiction in this case and that China no longer has a one-child policy. So why should we read Frog? In this series of video lectures, I want to answer that question in several ways. One is I think that in regards to the one-child policy, this is definitely a novel that moves beyond the topical, that we are dealing with the case of a bigger problem, and problems that do not go away just with a simple policy change. Second, this is a novel that does a lot of creative experiments with literary form. We have a novel that is nested within a series of letters and concludes with a play. So what are the different things that Moyen does with this structure, and why is it there in the first place? In this video lecture, I'll introduce some of the layers of symbolism that we find with frogs, but I'm not going to exhaust this topic. We'll discuss it more in future video lectures. In this video lecture, I want to argue that Moyen moves beyond just the topic of a particular event in history into a more imaginative space by creating what could be called a poetics of profusion, one that takes one simple motif and shows that it can be a symbol for many different things including some things that are not just based on Chinese history. Frog was written in 2009, and the year that the English translation came out was the year that the one-child policy ended. Moyen could not have anticipated that particular policy change, but whether intended or not, Moyen's novel now reads as something of a late-stage commentary on the one-child policy and its effects. Moyen is said to have been inspired to write the story because of a personal family connection. The character Gugu in this novel is supposedly based on Moyen's aunt, a family member who also worked as a midwife and performed abortions. So you could say that this is a novel based on a true story, but my speculation is, not knowing the actual facts of Moyen's aunt's life, is that frogs didn't appear quite so prominently in her real life story. Wa, the Chinese title of the novel, is a homophone for the word for infant or baby, and Moyen makes a lot of this sonic resemblance. This is by no means Moyen's first novel to focus on animals. We have that in Red Sorghum. We have it very prominently in Life and Death Are Wearing Me Out. I would also point out that within Frog, we don't just have frogs. We also have mules. We have water buffalo. We have all types of creatures. And so this is part of Moyen's menagerie, you could say. A menagerie that runs through many different works. The one-child policy was implemented beginning in 1979 and rolled out over the 1980s and early 1990s and it was a policy accompanied by a lot of propaganda. This was not, however, the first time that the government had taken an interest in family planning. Since the 1950s, you had had campaigns to encourage people to practice birth control and to have fewer children. This was a policy that had exceptions for certain groups like ethnic minorities and people in certain regions or people who had lost a child in the war, for example. But the idea was that by having fewer children, you were helping to promote the revolution. And the ubiquitous slogan found in villages and in cities was having only one, meaning one child, is good. A lot of the government messaging put forward this notion that your personal choices on whether or not to have children and when to have children directly affect the nation. The policy rationale was that if China's population grows too fast, this will stress the entire country. People won't have enough to eat. There will be too much competition for resources. The government recognized from early days that there was an ingrained traditional prejudice in favor of boys and against girls. Because boys were thought to be more productive, they can work the land, and they will support you in your old age. And so the government tried to counter that by saying girls are just as good as boys, and the government will be the one that supports you in your old age. The policy stipulated that it would be illegal for most families to have more than one child. There were also punishments for both the parents and the children. The parents would be fined and deprived of certain rights, 
and the children would also not be able to go to publicly funded school. The Chinese government has estimated that this policy prevented 400 million births. I'm not a population expert and I cannot evaluate that claim, but the claim has been made. This is also a policy that among all of the many Chinese government policies became iconic as symbolizing something about China, Chinese society, and Chinese government. And most of the commentary from abroad was highly negative. It was widely criticized for infringing on fundamental human rights, including reproductive freedom. One of the main criticisms of the policy was that it was unnecessary, that in fact by the time the policy was implemented, around 1979-1980, actually the Chinese birth rate was already falling, and falling enough that the policy didn't really encourage further declining in the birth rate. The many other criticisms included that this was a type of governmental interference in personal decisions. It was an invasion of privacy, and we certainly see that in the novel. People are literally dragged from their homes and forced to undergo medical procedures. And without a doubt, it is also an infringement on personal liberty. So the decision on whether or not to have a child is a very personal and familial one, but now the government is saying yes or no. The penalties for individuals and families were also severe. You could have forced or coerced abortions, you could have forced sterilization, the insertion of IUDs, parents would be fined, and again, the children would be prevented from enjoying the same rights as their peers, just because, of no fault of their own, they were the second or the third child. Other criticisms of the one-child policy from inside as well as outside China were that it had unintended negative consequences. It actually slowed economic growth, it exacerbated a gender imbalance, Prospective parents would determine the gender of the fetus and decide to abort if it was a girl. There were also infanticides of unwanted girls. Another criticism was not just that the policy itself was unfair, but that it was unfairly enforced and it disproportionately affected the poor. Whereas if you were rich or you had means, you could just flout the policy, have a second, third, fourth child, just pay the fine and get off scot-free. In the novel Frog, we have one character expressing that very concern and that officials, people with connections, people with a lot of money, can have as many children as they want. It's really us poor people who suffer. Moyen could not have known that five years after he wrote his novel, his artistic collaborator, the famous filmmaker Zhang Yimou, and his wife would be fined 1.2 million US dollars for breaching the one-child policy. The Chinese government itself estimates that in 2012, China had 40 million more males than females among the populace as a whole. China's sex ratio imbalance is acute, particularly in certain localities, and is one that has been tracked very closely by demographers and sociologists. Moyen's novel Frog, just like many of his other novels, presents women as being disproportionately victimized by history, just like women of yore were victimized by foot binding, that this was a male social fetish, this was part of the male-dominated social order that literally hobbled women. For a different view on the history of foot binding, you could look at Cinderella's Sisters by Dorothy Coe, This is a study that does not present women as victims, as has been the common way of talking about foot binding, but as agents who have their own desires and their own ways of participating in this cultural practice. To me, however, one of the implicit messages of Frog is that under the one-child policy, the people in China who disproportionately suffered from it were women. And a lot of these sufferings are really concentrated in the figure of Gugu, who suffers something of a persecution complex later in the novel. After performing all of these forced abortions and coercing people, to go along with national policy, she is the one who suffers. She suffers psychologically and emotionally. And she even has these nightmares in which the souls of all of the infants she aborted come back to haunt her, but as a horde of slimy frogs. In 2015, the Chinese government changed the one-child policy into a two-child policy. So now most families could have not one, but two children. Many observers, particularly in the medical community, believe that this was also a policy that came too late and wouldn't change very much. And since there's also big money in the Chinese market, you also had investment banks making estimates about how many more babies would be born, you know, and estimates of three to six million annually in a five-year period starting in 2017. Now in 2021, we have a three-child policy. So it is still a top-down kind of paternalistic control on the populace and on reproductive freedom, but there's a lot more latitude than before because we've realized that China has reached an inflection point in which there is a demographic crisis in the population aging too rapidly. So once again, Chinese people are supposed to help the economy and help the country, but this time by procreating. So why Frog? What does this novel do besides just tell us the history that we already know? Well, let's begin with the obvious. Frogs and humans are a little bit different. Still, human infants and frogs do share a similarity in that they sound the same, at least in Chinese. Gugu is a character who brings many babies into the world and prevents many from being born. The character Yuan Sai also has some agency. You'll remember that earlier in the novel, before this particular scene, 
he was associated with reproduction and that he allegedly removed the IUD from Wang Renmei, Tadpole's wife, and this led to a crisis for the narrator, who's supposed to be a party member and upholding policy as a member of the military. So Wa is a term that sounds like many different things, many different meanings. This includes Niu Wa, the creator of mankind, who I'll talk about in a future video lecture. But the croaks of frogs and the cries of human babies sound similar as well. Moyen is a novelist and not a naturalist, but I think there are several types of what we could call biosymbolism related to frogs. Frogs have a natural urge to procreate, and they copulate indiscriminately, kind of like tortoises, which is a term of insult in Chinese, and that they lay their eggs outside their body, and then they are fertilized by someone else, whichever male happens to be in the neighborhood. But this is a type of natural instinct. There's no ethical consideration here. You just lay your eggs or you inseminate them. So the reproductive capacity is several orders of magnitude greater than that of humans. Another key difference is that the reproduction occurs outside of the body, so we're not carrying all of these babies to term. But the results can be astounding. The novel says a lot about procreation by humans and by frogs, but it also talks about consumption. And I just want to focus on one particular scene in which we have a convergence between procreation and consumption in the scene of implied cannibalism. Cannibalism, I would note in passing, is a recurring theme in Chinese fiction, not just modern fiction, but also pre-modern fiction of the imperial period as well. Studies by Tina Lu, Gang Yue, and Yu Chun Cai would be good places to start. So would the short story A Madman's Diary by Lu Xun. For readers of Moyen, I highly recommend The Republic of Wine, in which we have cannibalism as a type of symptom of abundance, of this material abundance, too much food. And how are you going to differentiate yourself from others? Well, let's move beyond the usual types of food and start consuming babies. In this scene, we have several characters at a restaurant, and one character introduces our narrator to another character. He says, he was quite a runner in his youth, and we assumed he grew up to be a champion athlete, never expecting him to be a playwright. His name is Wan Zhu, but everyone calls him Xiao Pao. Now he goes by Tadpole. Tadpole's my pen name, I explained. So tadpole was a runner, which is a little bit ironic since tadpoles don't have legs, but legs are the part of the frog that people usually eat. In this same scene, we have a convergence of frogs and humans, production and consumption, also in the onomatopoeia, where these frog croaks sound like babies' cries. A third convergence between production and consumption is identity. So we have a playwright sitting down at this meal of frogs, in which he is being asked to essentially consume himself. In this scene, we have a kind of consumption logic being dramatized, in which you are what you eat, or at least you will take on the properties of what you eat, which is very odd when you consider that he's being asked to eat himself. And we're told that there's a Korean researcher who has extracted peptides from frog skin, and that this is a type of anti-aging compound. And as a bonus, it can also increase a woman's chances of conceiving twins. Tadpole is being asked to consume frogs. And this is one example of how Frog the novel uses history and experience as just a starting point for a whole variety of explorations about language, like the homophonic resonance of wa, of ethics, gender, and creativity, all tied to this non-human symbol of hyper-productive capacity.